Bienvenidos to Merendeando, part of Radio Luna Tire. Today we are chatting with an artist from the Rutas Festival, Nina Bogen. And to help me co-host this interview, we have an amazing playwright, writer, producer, performer, and director, Yago Mesquita. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here and to talk to Nina, who is an award-winning Brazilian multidisciplinary artist, puppeteer, singer, actress, and director. And we're so excited to see her upcoming show at the Rutas Festival, Peter and the Wolf, or Pedro e o Lobo. And this conversation was so much fun, and we got to talk to her about her calling to puppetry. How her journey in puppetry has taken her all over the world to share her art. And we got to know more about her process in creating the show you're watching at Rutas, Peter and the Wolf. What an amazing conversation. Let's get started. Welcome, Nina! We know you've been traveling the world, so it's amazing to have you for at least one hour to have this conversation with us before you come to Toronto, to the Rutas Festival. Thank you, thank you. Yes, I'm very excited and it's my honor and it's going to be a pleasure to be back in Toronto for the Rutas Festival, yes. We know you started working in arts at a young, young age with music and then theater, but now you are also a puppeteer. So we want to know like, when did you say like, puppet chose you? What, and what do you mean by that? Because I heard in a previous interview, you say that they chose you. And, and like, when was the moment that you knew, like, this is a passion for me? Well, yes, as you've said, I started like learning and studying uh, music when I was five years old. My mom was a piano teacher. <laughs> so like my childhood, uh, when I was a teenager, my entire life, I, I've been always surrounded by art. Uh, music, dance, theater, literature, but, but, but never puppetry. That, that, is, that is something that I always reflect on that here where I am, because I am now, right now, I'm in the south of Brazil where I lived when I was a child. So it's curious because uh, we don't have a puppetry tradition. here. I found out, like I fell in love with puppetry when I was 30 I even forgot. <laughs> oh my God. I was like 35, I guess. And uh, no, I, I'm lying, 34. But anyway, <laughs> yes, I, I, sometimes I lie. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's me. And then uh, I went into a play of Compagnie Dos à Deux, that is a French Brazilian company. They're just great, great uh, dancers and, and actors. And they have a pretty deep and long uh, research, like for more than 20 years now, on the gestural theater. And I knew they had invited a friend of mine that was an actress from Rio. We were in Sao Paulo. I was at the premiere with a friend of mine. And I kept saying, who is the older actress? Who is the older actress? I don't see like in the in the, the tack and the fire. And then it's, at one point he looked at me and said, Nina, is a puppet. And I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> no, it is not be true. No. And, and I'm like, I have, um, I'm foresighted. So I kept like doing the thing with my hands just in order to see. And then I was in shock that it was a puppet. And for me, that old lady, the puppet, was the strongest actors like in in the scene on stage and they are pretty good actors so that for me it was like a, a, a completely like universe that just whoa it just opened in front of me and I was like no I can't sleep and at that point yes I'm obsessed and then I said no 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 this cannot be true there was not a puppet and I said oh my god that was a puppet but anyway it was so like her eyes and the movements with the music and the precision, I said, this cannot be true. It was so powerful that it drawn like all your attention. So long story short, I found out that was a Russian puppeteer that has built that puppet. I called her the next day in Russian. That's me. <laughs> and then I like had this idea of transforming to lose Lautrec, the French painter from the 19th century, which I already had at that time a research on him because it was my end of the bachelor studies presentation. 
So it was my, my final uh, presentation. And I used to play him, but to lose the track, as you know, or may, may not know, perhaps, like his parents were cousins at first uh, degree. So mm -hmm. he was born with uh, kind of healthy problems. And he broke both of his legs. So he had a body of a man, of an adult, but the legs of a child. He was not a dwarf, as people think. No, 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 no. He was born and he broke his legs. So when mm. I used to play him, it was a, a little bit caricatural. I didn't like it. But when I had the idea of transforming him like into a human scale puppet, and then I said, okay, that's it. And then, long story short, uh, Natasha Belova, that, that was the Russian puppeteer, who made this puppet that I've seen in, in Compagnie dos Adeux play. She had opened like for the first time an artistic residency in Chile. And I was selected and I spent two months and I made my first puppet. And when I say puppets choose us to answer your question, like the whole story, <laughs> um, it's because, you know, like I've studied to be a lyric singer, like for more than 20 years, can you imagine? So if someone like, I don't know, a couple of years ago told me, oh, Nina, you're going to become a puppeteer. <laughs> I would laugh. <laughs> I would laugh as I laugh. Like, and that person said, oh, yeah, right. But when I look at my pictures when I was a child, in all the pictures, I have a little doll or little puppet with me. So we don't have a tradition in puppetry. But me, as a child, I used to, to always carry along with me a doll. And I used to play all the time with them. So that catches me my attention. And when I talk to other puppeteers, like since I started in the world of puppetry, my artistic career and my life changed completely, completely. And I felt as if I finally found the art form that is generous enough and that englobes all the other art forms because puppetry is the meeting of the arts of the scene, arts on the stage and the visual arts and music. So for me, it's like the most complete art form and most generous art form that ever existed and is a milliner art form and is universal. So um, I, have, I don't have any doubts that the puppets chose me. <laughs> <laughs> and I interact with them and yes, we, we associate and, and things happen. That's incredible. I love that you saw you, you it was like, who's the actor? It's a puppet, like, <laughs> wow, that's... Oh. Yes, it was exactly like that. It's like boom, and then the, like you know, like oh, the Armageddon of my life and a revelation. I said yes, <laughs> that's it. Yeah. <laughs> and oh, and there's like something curious about it too. That when I went to Chile, yeah, I can you can imagine. I, I lived in São Paulo, that is like the biggest city in Latin America. It's a wild and crazy city, and it's really expensive. So the first thing I thought was like. How am I going to do that, to manage to stay two months in Chile and to continue to pay the rent and, and do my things here? And I got sponsored. <laughs> <laughs> so like, yeah, yeah, I got sponsored. It was like something completely out of the box. And, and then like, it was the perfect situation, you know? It was destiny. For me, I think yeah. it's like when you're yes, destined for yes, something, yes, yes, you're yes, yes. destined for something. I yeah. had like this, like had the, like a little box mm -hmm. with my research of Toulouse Low Track. I went to Casino. There's a French company, huge. I don't know it, how like how they received me at the first place. <laughs> I presented my research. I'm serious. And then there were like two women, and they fell in love with the research. And I had never built a puppet, and they paid me like they paid me, they paid me. <laughs> A lot of money to build my first stop. And I was like, okay. And at the same time, like this put me like an immense responsibility because I yeah. couldn't do like a monster or whatever puppet. Like, you know, 
I really had to build up a bit. So like that already put me like at the same time a weight and responsibility. But and in the other hand, it made it possible for me to stay two months and study and to be with other artists from around the world that had already previous experience in puppetry. I think it's interesting too that Toulouse Lautrec was also a caricaturist and the reason why the puppet made sense was because you felt like you were being a caricature of him. Yes. So like it feels kind of like this full circle and like Monica said, it's destiny. Destiny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes, and because of Toulouse or Track, and then I made like a short performance that I started to present in festivals, and then um, like the play that was one hour in ten. So I used to play the four women that were friends with him at the time: singer, a clown, uh, and two dancers, and him as a puppet. And because of that work, I won two scholarships from the government of Quebec to do a master. But I have never, I have never applied for that uh, scholarship. <laughs> so <laughs> I left because I, I'm really sincere. And I was like, no, 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 you're mistaken. It's not me. I wrote to them saying that they were mistaken. <laughs> and then they were like, no, 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 no. we're not mistaken. The scholarship, <laughs> the scholarship wow. is for you. It's like because we really liked your, your work, and then we sent it. There was only like one scholarship from the entire second cycle, mm -hmm. the Université de, du Québec à Montréal, you come. And yeah, and then in 17 days, I went to Canada. That was already another crazy story. So, like, <laughs> I, when I say puppets really chose me, they really chose me. I'm not like, I'm kidding, I laugh a lot, but it's like when you start mm -hmm. joining all the dots, you know, looking back. No, yeah, I think that's it's incredible. When you're put in a path that is like, this is your path, that like the world will tell you this is the right path. Like, don't worry. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious, when you did your first puppet, basically, how was that for you? How how did you figure out? Because, yeah, inspiration, all the stuff, but to actually like do the, the work, how did you went about that? was pretty hard as I said because I like it's different when you create like a character out of your imagination everything mm -hmm. is possible when you do that so yeah fantastic work but even when you have pictures of Toulouse Lautrec and we don't have many good pictures of him from the 19th century you know beginning of the 20th um, and because of the technique that Natasha Belova uh, teaches it's something really serious like <laughs> the funny story is that I thought that I would arrive in Chile. And then we would put like all the pictures in the computer. And I don't know, we'd do something like, you know, 360 degrees and said, yeah, that's it, ta-da. And, oh, <laughs> and then the head would come out. And then she came like with a piece of um, clay. Mm -hmm. And then she said in French to me, like, voici la terre. And I was like, what? Voici la terre, here's the clay. And then in front of me, I said, okay, what am I supposed to do? He said, first, you have to draw. You have to draw all the, like, all the, um, the plans of Toulouse Rotaka's face. Mm. And then you have to sculpt it. And, <laughs> oh. and I was like, okay. She's like telling me, as I, I made like a parallel, as if like a person that has never seen an opera before, would come to an, an atelier or a workshop and then someone would say, in two months, you have to sing an entire opera. And then I was like, oh my God. <laughs> 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 and I used to cry. I'm that person because I'm really intense and I'm perfectionist. Mm -hmm. And I want, and I had to do something good. I couldn't do like whatever. No, 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 no. I, that wasn't an option. You know, I was sponsored. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And then she used to get like my, she got like, I think two or three times my heart and put it in the garbage. That was the level of the thing. And I used to cry and I say, oh my God. And no one, no assistant could touch the clay because she has like a thing that when you put your energy into, into the thing, it changes. But I am a self-taught person. I'm a self-taught since I was a kid. So I observe a lot. I'm very, I'm like really in the, all the details. And there was this French girl. She was incredible, incredible artist. 
And then she said, Nina, I'm not going to touch the clay, but observe how I do it. And then I sit close to her and then I started looking. And then some, at some point I just said, okay, the, the crazy thing is that Toulouse Lautrec spent his life inside an artist's atelier, mm -hmm. drawing, painting with sculptures too. And I found myself inside an atelier with other artists in order to find him. And then I said, okay, at one point I have to drink some wine and I have to, you know, <laughs> stroll on the streets and observe people and enjoy life because he used to do that. So I said, okay, Toulouse, like guide me here. We're, we're together in this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have to make you come to life, please. And then I was in the street and seriously, I found two rocks, two brown rocks. And then I had this idea of making his um, eyes and I was the only person in the atelier that made his eyes. And when you see the eyes, everyone in the audience, that was the audience telling me after, his eyes are alive. With these two rocks, I made an experience with plastic because I'm really like, I, I, I'm an explorer. I'm a researcher, but with practical things. And as a self-taught person, I said, okay, why not this rock? And then I kept the rock and I remember the assistant telling me, this is not going to work. I said, I don't care. Let's, let's try. So the last part after doing the sculpture, I had to put the eyes on it. And because of this uh, rock and plastic, uh, the eyes got really like with a, a different light and it shined mm. really, really strong. Like the, the light of the theater would just hit his eyes and that he was already alive. It was really strong. And another curious thing about this story is that the premiere was at the Museum of Bozar the, in Chile. So the premiere of Toulouse of Reiki came to life in a museum. That, that for me is like, yes, incredible. This, this all sounds like a yes. movie. Yes, 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 yes. This could be a movie. Yeah, this, this should be a be movie. A movie. <laughs> Yes, so like I found myself as a visual artist too. Puppeteers are also visual arts, but not all puppeteers. It depends on the school. Like in Russia, they divide things. So if you build a puppet, you don't manipulate a puppet. I don't usually say the word manipulate, but people do. So you animate a puppet. I learned everything together. It's a lot of skills to learn in a short period of time, so fast. So, yes. And then I, I just fell in love with uh, sculpture, with drawing, with, you know, I found out like I have these other abilities and I continue to study them, of course, you know. I wanted to ask, we, we saw this line in your bio and, and it was really striking for, for me in particular. It says, poet of the invisible. When new fantastic worlds ask her to be born, she materializes them out of a piece of fabric, a musical note, a few colors, and a block of foam. This is beautiful, first of all. I think you encapsulate really like an artist. It was, it was a friend of mine. It was a friend of mine who is a writer that wrote that. So I have to, to it was Magali Bales uh, from France. And she, I think she captured, because like when I lived in Mont Montreal, in Montreal um, she used to live in Montreal too. We became really good friends. And she started really to admire all the stories and everything. And she met Toulouse Old Track too. Wow. <laughs> and yes, and at the end of that year, um, she wrote it. And, and I felt so honored and I felt like it like she captured what I but what I actually do, you know, because to talk about our our own work is I found very difficult. Yes. We can sometimes I see people and said, okay, this person is exaggerating a little bit, or this person is not being fair with, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the work. So it's it's can be tricky. So that line is not mine, it's hers. But um, when when I think what she means is that poet of the invisible, I consider art as a spiritual exercise. And I don't say it often, but it's true. Mm -hmm. And it's not something I consider to be mystical. It can be mystical sometimes, but I don't consider like all well, the stories I'm telling you, <laughs> they are so true and funny at the same time. And I didn't even arrive at the point where I went to France 
to Montmartre with Toulouse Lautrec, and it was the last time I presented him because something happened so strong that I really felt that that was the that it wouldn't be respectful to continue mm -hmm. to present our journey together at to that point. So uh, and people say, but are you so crazy? Like you should continue performing. You could go to festivals. You want to scholarship? I said, no, 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 no. I I feel that I'm guided. I feel we are all guided. Some people have sensibility to listen to it or to let themselves be guided. And others don't. And I don't believe someone is genius. I believe someone has a genius. Mm. And then we associate with energies and with things in order to offer something to life and to other people through art, you know. And as I work with different mediums, because I'm a musician, lyric singer, director, actress, and puppeteer, it depends. Sometimes the inspiration just comes like, out of nowhere an idea and I said okay but um I never I think it would be pretentious to say that those are my ideas mm. and that I did it because it's not fair mm. I'm guided <laughs> as, as strange as can be especially for people in North America I remember the girls and university looking at me like what is she talking about because in some parts of the planet Puppetry is considered to be sacred. The, the story mm -hmm. of puppetry, the history of puppetry is started like that. So if you go to Indonesia, what I'm saying is perfectly normal. Some parts of China in India. And here in Brazil, we consider a lot too. I talk with other puppeteers and we respect that. So I say, listen to the... And, and also, because people separate, people say, oh, this is, this is matter. Mm -hmm. And that is energy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but like... We consider it, it's not me saying it was the genius, it was Einstein that said that they're the same. We consider it to be theory, but in, in the practical terms, uh, from my experience, is that all the inspiration and the things we create, it's not completely ours. And, and that is good because it keeps us like, like humble also, okay. you know, to say yes. I can fail, it can be good, but it, it's not only me. Yes, of course, I give my energy, I have my intelligence, I have my creativity, but also the creativity, the spark of creativity that we all have inside of us, no matter in which profession you, you are, uh, which profession you have, it is something that has a kind of, that is inexplicable. Mm -hmm. I believe that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that. Those points about matter and energy, I know you kind of are referencing them as like a whole in like your practice and like your process. Um, but it makes me think about when I was in theater school and I did a puppetry class and like all kind of everything we learned was really like, like the points about matter and energy make me think that like the puppet is nothing until you breathe like your life into it, breathe your energy into it. And like, I found my old puppet today before this because I like wanted to like see it and like looking at it as just a pile of materials and then for me to then touch it and like as soon as I like bring it up it's a thing it's like a person it's like a living being and almost like an extension of me so yeah rambly thoughts <laughs> over but that's what that makes me think of yes yes <laughs> and speaking more about puppeteering, do you think that there's something that puppeteering can achieve with storytelling that it might be different from other art forms? Yes, exactly uh, because of what Iago just said. Mm. Because you can make it alive in front of people. When you tell a story, people are going to project the image inside their heads, in their imagination. Mm -hmm. And when you bring a puppet and then you give it life to it, so the story is alive. And there is also part of the life of the puppet that is also the projection of the audience. Mm -hmm. It is. I also believe that, that we, we also project life. But the puppeteer really like animates the story. So it's like bringing the story into 3D, but not the way actors do. Mm -hmm. Different. 
difference because the puppet is the symbol in itself. Mm. And we're talking about symbol, symbolic life too. And that is very powerful. That is a very powerful tool. And no matter, like people, some people think and underestimate puppetry, uh, like, oh, it's just for kids. No, yeah. it's not. It's absolutely not. And that's my whole experience since the beginning has shown me exactly, it, sometimes like even the opposite of that, that I presented more to adults than uh, to children. It's crazy. Even Peter and the Wolf. <laughs> there were more more um, adults in the audience than than children. I think that that makes me then think about considering that Peter and the Wolf or Pedro y Lobo um, is like a children's story. What is it about that piece that you now like drew you to create an interpretation adaptation of it? Uh, well. First, I received an invitation, like out of nowhere, <laughs> just the place. I have all the sorts of stories that are really like kind of crazy and funny, but it was in the middle of the pandemic. And then I received this invitation to be actress, puppeteer, narrator of Peter and the Wolf, because as you know, Peter and the Wolf is this classic fable that was adapt adapted to um, symphonic orchestral music 86 years ago uh, in order to make the audiences, especially young audiences, to know the sections of an orchestra and the instruments of an orchestra. So it has like also a pedagogical goal mm. for it. Well, I received an invitation. Uh, I spend like the whole pandemic, the two years or, yeah, two years or more, two years, almost two years and a half, presenting Concordes that was the heart. A one-on-one -on -one experience, very intense, to more than 20 countries. Wow. So you can imagine, like, I presented 153 sessions uh, of 30, 35, 45 minutes, one-on-one. -on -one. And then someone called me and invited me to present and said, where we are going to perform? Are there going to be other puppeteers? No. Uh, you were indicated by two conductors because you, oh, you do like your one woman like as a soloist. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, yes, that's true. But Peter and the Wolf, we have like eight, nine characters. And then I said, okay, uh, and where you're going to present? And then she said, in the Sala São Paulo, São Paulo Concert Hall. That is the biggest concert hall in Latin America. <laughs> So I looked up and I said, oh, my God. <laughs> I spent two years presenting on one one, like one zero at a time. And I'm going to present like to more than 2,000 people on stage. And they don't have police. Uh, what's the word for that? I always forget. Like in the theater, the, um, the police, um, the parts that like you can hide things and, you know, the, the sides. I know, I know, I think in Spanish we call it like piernas. Yes, yes, yes. But I don't know. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I don't know in English, but in French it's coulisse, so mm -hmm. we don't have that. You just have the open, empty stage and a full symphonic orchestra. I said, oh my God. It's the okay. wings. The wings. Yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so we don't have wings in this concert hall. You know, it's beautiful and, and huge. And I said, okay. And then suddenly, like, I had this vision. This often happens. I have the vision. I, I, I know, I see it. I really see it, like, in 3D in front of me. And I'm not very good with 2D, though. I'm a synesthetical <laughs> person. So i like, okay. And then I try to figure out how is that going to be possible? Like, how is it going to be possible to build things? And what I saw, what I have seen in this vision, like, woof, in front of me, woof. I said, oh my God, all the characters are part of instruments. And then I said, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I like that. There's something from the opera too. And there's something about costumes that I just figured out that I'm a costume designer. <laughs> mm -hmm. Even though I, I never present myself as that. Yes, 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 yes. I have just been selected to Prague Quadrennial. And they sent me a letter like because of the, of the design. I said, yeah. <laughs> and then 
well, so what drove me to it's like my passion for instruments. I spent my my childhood with orchestra, with musicians. My life, I think the first sense is the audition to me. So I said, okay, I'm going to continue. I'm going to explore, to go further in what Prokofiev, the Russian composer, uh, had in mind. I'm going to, to associate the design of parts of instruments with the movement. And that is the puppet. So some are not even puppets, they're objects, like a chin rest that transformed into a half of a mask. I don't know. And then I started like to go, go, go deeper and deeper. But there's something that is, uh, that associate, that links mm -hmm. the two arts, the art of luthery, of building instruments, wooden instruments, that craftsmen, um, the luthier, the luthery, I think in English, luthery. But anyway, it comes in French again. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay. Um, that is the art of building in wooden instruments for the string section. And the theater of animation, as we say, we don't say puppet theater in Brazil. Theater of animation. This term was created here. Mm -hmm. And it englobes more art forms. So it's more universal, more universal than just puppet theater. And the reason I'm saying that is because what they have in common is the anima. Anima in Latin means the breath of life, the soul. And for example, in a violin, the luthier, what the, the, the piece that is going to create the harmony, the harmonics and the, of the sounds between the front and the fund of the instrument is a small piece called soul, anima. So he places like so this is millimetrical. If he doesn't catch the right place, the sound is not going to be the same. So it's years of study to get that. And if you see what I, what I had in mind when I created the, the costume, the wearable, as I call it, for Peter and the Wolf, I dress, I wear a piece of a violin. So I play with this, this concept that the instruments and the theater of animation needs to find the soul in order to create the harmony of everything. I'm so excited to watch it. When we're going to see you here at Rutas, you're collaborating with the Toronto Euphonia Chamber Ensemble. So how did that collaboration with like orchestra started? Uh, well, Rosalind that is the, the director of Euphonia. I think she works with uh, Pragna Desai, that is one of the directors of um, Theater Direct. Mm -hmm. She was the one that connected me with Euphonia Ensemble. And we had some meetings and it's going to be a little bit different because it's not a symphonic orchestra, mm -hmm. but we are going to have like, uh, we also going to have different instruments to replace. Because Peter and the Wolf, we can play it with a symphony orchestra or we can play it with an ensemble. Mm -hmm. it, that, well, it's possible, you know, to work like that. And I'm really excited. I have never met Roslyn in person. I'm going to meet them like, uh, but I know they are virtuosos in the instruments. And, you know, they're like really, really excellent, amazing musicians. So I think it's going to be fun, really and also an honor to play with them. And, and I'm also glad that the Rutas have like chosen a piece that is also for young audiences. Yes. I think it's important, you know, and it's not like a festival for young audiences and it's not a festival for puppet theater. I love yeah. that. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> I love that. Invite different audiences and, and different art forms. I think it's it's really nice really generous are there any specific kinds of conversations or any kind of engagement that you hope the ruta show of peter and the wolf will bring to audiences well i i've seen the other uh, flyers like with other artists and i know like uh, it's it's more like about uh, political choices and positions but I think um, Peter and the Wolf is a classic, classic repertoire. 
But what I think this adaptation brings that for me is also political, but in another way, in a different way, mm. is that even though this world is so twisted and so difficult and complicated, the world we live in, there's also space for magic and for enchantment and for you know light and for the child that inhabits us all. So I think that is is also a political act. Yeah, yes. <laughs> um we I, we were talking to Beatriz Pisano about this piece and, and she was saying how all her adult friends they're looking for for this show in particular. And I just want to know, like, what do you think is it's so magical about the story that even adults are like, I want to be there? I think like if if the people have like listened to the story, you know, like this old discs when we were kids, mm -hmm. I used to listen to the stories in those discs or even like uh, through parents or some people were like their first concerts that they have like seen in their in their lives. So I think there is like a fond memory in a, an affective memory of it but this adaptation it was really surprising for me uh, because like on stage after the rehearsals or after the the performance most adults would come to me and say oh Nina I'm so glad I came and, and I'm so glad because like I love, I used to love Peter and the Wolf when I was a kid. And then I, I just started hating it <laughs> because people were like reading, the actors were reading in the, during the narration with the orchestra and, and it was so boring, you know? And I was like, oh, thank you for being honest. And then they said like, and this I heard a couple of times. So that's what I, I kept like in my heart because they said, you made me fun and live again. So I was really like glad really for me as an artist said, okay, I did it. Because uh, it was not my favorite story as a child, but there's another layer to that, a symbolic layer mm -hmm. that I don't, I think I've never talked about that in an interview or even in the documentary. The, the visual symbolism of it, all the characters are in me. I am all the characters. So I am Peter. Peter is an extension of me. I am also the wolf. I'm also the duck. I'm also, you know, everything except for the hunters. <laughs> <laughs> except for the hunters. The hunters have said, no, no, no. Hunters, uh, <laughs> the hunter is, is the conductor. The hunter is not me. I don't want guns. I don't like that. I don't like weapons. I'm not for it. So no. But all the others uh, characters are in me. And then I think for children or for an adult, even though it's not sad, but the symbolism is there. So unconscious people relate to it. And, and it's a story about courage. It's a story about courage. A small, the smallest character I have, no, the bird is smaller, but anyway, the smaller, smallest one, like the bird and Peter, they are able to catch the wolf, you know, and also to save him. So it's, it's bravery. I think also coming out of, of, uh, of so much isolation in the world and, and sitting and seeing something that is not only nostalgic, but like comforting and like amazing. It's like, what a, what a, what a way to reenter the, the world and the arts. So I want to say, yeah, like, yes. also thank you for being like such a passionate, amazing <laughs> artist because everything we have heard from your journey, I, we, I think we can truly see it's like some people are born to be artists. Mm -hmm. And I think you're one of those people because the world keeps telling you, the destiny keeps telling you, everything keeps telling you. And oh, I'm so I'm so excited to to be able to see your art live. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Monica. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, I'm excited. I'm really excited. And, I, and I'm glad that Frutos Festival can bring like um, artists from all over the Americas. I think this is really, really important, mm -hmm. really important. And to be able to be like... Uh, everyone together again, you know, after being all these years through Zoom mm -hmm. and digital experiences, it's also very important. So yes, I, I'm really glad for this opportunity and for the generosity of the directors and the festival. 
I, I didn't mention it at any point in this interview, but I'm also Brazilian. I, I've noticed when you said <laughs> Pedro Lobo, I said, okay. Um, but as a Brazilian Canadian artist, the community of Brazilian artists in Canada feels very small. And I only know about like a handful or two of people. So I'm curious about if there's any Brazilian artists that you know that excite you or that you want to quickly give a shout out to. Uh, Brazilian artists in Canada, you mean? In general. Let's, let's, let's just make it international. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, there are Brazilian actors that, uh, artists that, lots of them actually. Um, I would say, for instance, Artur uh, e André, that are for comp uh, Compagnie Dos a Deux, that they travel the world. In Canada, in Montreal, there are like lots of musicians, Brazilian musicians, wonderful. I would say composer Gabriel Schwartz, love his music, really stunning artist. And that is one puppeteer that just won a contest, international contest, that is Daniele Viola. I really enjoy her research. And, and whenever I can, I'm always presenting Brazilian and making bridges. Like in South Korea, I, I just, I couldn't just present my work. So I created like a website and I started making bridges in between artists. So mm -hmm. yes, I think we have something different from the Latin Americans. I'm sorry, but we do. First of all, the language. <laughs> 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 and we are a continent in ourselves, 200 million people. And also Brazil is the only country in the world different from you know, the United States in the colonization or miscegenation of Canada then we have all the continents, miscegenation here. So we are the true melting pot in Latin America, but that is a whole new discussion. That is. And I think it allows us to have like creativity and freedom, you know, in a way. And in the other way, of course, we know of the colonization of imaginaries and imperialism and everything, you know, but yeah. I appreciate the way Brazilians create. I think uh, we, we are blessed with that being this melting pot. Very nice. Thank you. Obrigado. Thank you. <laughs> Obrigado <a> você. <laughs> and because we're getting to the end, every episode we ask our current guests to post a question to the next guest so we can keep the conversation going across practices and across borders. This season we're doing questions from other artists from Ruta, so your question comes from Claren Gross, who has the show I Love the Smell of Gasoline. And Claren's question for you is, what do you do outside theater that fools you as a human and as an artist? Wow, I would say to travel <laughs> and see the world and you know the humans uh, you know out there and spiritual practice. I think this combined, but I'm not talking about religion. I'm talking about spiritual practice. There is something completely different. Can be just like contemplating and to realize like you're alive mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and how beautiful this is, how challenging and beautiful. In the spirit of keeping the conversation going, what do you want to ask to our next guest who is also another artist in the Rutas Festival? Well, so I was talking about Anima because it's the name of the mini documentary that is going to be presented after Peter and the Wolf that shows like oh, yeah. all the creative process of it. So anima in Latin means the breath of life or it, or it could also be translated as soul in English. So I would like to ask the artist, how do you share your anima with your audience? Ooh, that's a good, good question. Mic drop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much Monica thank you very much Iago thank you Lucia so so nice and very like open-minded and generous and yes really nice talking to you and we'll see you live yes we will check out the Rutas Festival from September 22nd to October 9th for more information visit alunatheater.ca hope to see you there we're speaking from Takoronto this is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, the Wendat, and Mississaugas of the Credit. This land is covered by the digital one spoon wampum and Treaty 13, also known as the Toronto Purchase. At Aluna, 
We remember that people can begin to heal when they are hurt. We are committed to artful participation in disagreements. We are committed to unsettling ourselves towards connection, respect, and justice for all people who now live in this city, which has been a meeting place since time immemorial. Radio Luna Teatro is supported by Luna Theater with support from the Toronto Arts Council, the Ontario Arts Council, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Department of Canadian Heritage, and TD Bank. Aluna Theater is Beatriz Pisano and Trevor Shellness. Radio Luna Teatro is produced by Monica Garrido and Lucia Linares. For more about Aluna Theater, visit us at alunatheater.ca, follow at Aluna Theater on Twitter or Instagram, or like us on Facebook.